I, I'm probably one of those uh, the people who worries about fragmentation, tribalisation, atomization in Australia, about the breakdown of stable political leadership, yeah. about what I see as poor economic management. I could go on and on and on. But one area where I've genuinely thought we were making some progress is that I've been one of those people, I suppose, who's thought, well, it's good that men are opening up more, that dads are relating more to their boys, uh, that we, um, you know, we've moved through a lot of what was very necessary, I think, from the feminist movement. But you're really confronting me, and you know, I mean, you've got the statistics to back it up, to say that the way we pat ourselves on the back about the progress we've made is yes. hiding some very different truths. Yes, that's exactly right, John. Uh, I think we'd like to think that some things have improved and probably some things have improved, but the stories that I'm hearing uh, at the coalface are getting worse and they're getting worse younger. So one of the most common questions I'm now getting from year seven girls is how do I say no without hurting his feelings? Uh, I have girls telling me stories that they experience wolf whistling, catcalling every day from the age of eight or nine. I have girls telling me about being hassled every day at school to send uh, naked images. I have girls telling me that uh, they are groped on the school bus every day on the way home. I have girls reporting incidents to me that are happening at school, which then I have to make mandatory uh, reports about uh, what our girls are having to endure every day shows that actually we, we really haven't made enough progress and that boys think they can do this stuff and get away with it. Uh, it's, a, it's a tragedy and I'm now speaking on these issues in primary school. You know, I had a teacher say to me the other day that she was talking to a group of year seven girls and she was curious as to what the boys talked to them about at school. And the girls said porn, they talked to us about the porn they watched the night before. And the teacher said, surely you are exaggerating. Surely they want to interact with you on other things. And they said, no, that's all I want to talk to us about. So she then went to check with the year seven boys and said, boys, is this really what you talk to the girls about? And the boys said, yes, that's what we talk about. Um, the girls are being asked, you know, show us your tits at, at school. Um, the demands for naked se selfies, most girls I know have experienced uh, a demand for uh, a sexual picture. Uh, they say to me, we don't know how to stand up for themselves ourselves. We don't know how to say uh, no. And they want the harassment uh, to stop. But again, the boys are getting these cultural messages that this is acceptable from video games, from, from porn, uh, from, from rap artists with extremely degrading misogynist lyrics. So our message is, you know, it's hard to get our message through when that's what we're, what we're up against. While I'm sure there was a, you know, a fair bit of inappropriate talk and uh, what have you in the playground uh, when we were younger, mm. my impression is that it's now not just talk, it's acting out, it's vastly different. Mm. So instead of becoming, if you like, more civilised, we become less civilised. Mm. And you're identifying what's driving that. Yes. The early yes. sexualisation of children. Yes, sexualisation of children and what we call porn culture, pornified culture. Uh, our children are growing up in a shadow cast by uh, pornography, pornographic imagery, pornographic uh, themes. Uh, they are imbibing from very early ages. Uh, we know uh, the average age of first exposure is 11. That's the average, not even the first age. Uh, I'm being told stories of uh, seven, eight year old boys uh, being exposed to rape porn, torture porn, sadism porn, incest porn. And uh, they think this is normal. They think this is what sexuality is and should look like. And this is how they should uh, behave. And we are carrying out an unprecedented assault on the healthy sexual development of our children. I don't know how our young people will be able to form healthy, intimate relationships when pornography is their formative sexual uh, environment. Uh, how, will we, how will they understand about what true intimacy and human connection and even sensuality uh, look like when they're learning from porn. Uh, just recently, a, a young woman told me that when she's on dating sites, uh, she puts, she lists as a fetish, uh, wanting to stare into someone's eyes and make love slowly. Because she said if she doesn't list that as a fetish, it'll just get dismissed. So it has to be seen as this kind of weird. That's a fetish? <laughs> that's a weird, crazy fetish she has wanting to look longingly into someone's eyes and make love slowly because that's like that's really weird right <laughs> that's so weird that you would want to do that 
Uh, we're seeing a rise of uh, physical injuries in, in girls based on porn-inspired sexual acts. Uh, again, I don't know how much of you want, how much of this you want to go to edge on, uh, but uh, we're seeing a rise of choking and strangulation in girls, uh, even high school girls. Uh, uh, again, from porn-inspired acts that boys want to carry out. Uh, another young woman told me recently that her last four Tinder hookups, uh, she said the men went for my throat without even asking. So <laughs> you can see this um, barbaric sexual practices that are inspired by a global porn industry worth 150 billion US a year uh, is More than the GDP of many of the countries on it. Well, correct. That's right. Uh, we are inscribing new codes of conduct and sexual conduct specifically in our, our boys and young men. And what does this mean for, for relationships, for long-term partnering? Uh, boys are finding real girls actually kind of boring because they get so much novelty from porn. Uh, we're now, uh, you know, I just read a research paper before coming to see you about how boys are queuing to computers. So they see a computer screen and they're being aroused, but they're not being aroused by real girls or, or even uh, by skin to skin contact. They say we're not, um, that does nothing for us. It's the novelty of what they're going to see online. And we're seeing rising rates of erectile dysfunction now in young men at rates never before seen. This used to be an, an older man's uh, disease. And uh, now young men are experiencing that because again of the deluge of of pornography. Some of the boys in this study that I just read this week uh, started consuming porn or being exposed to porn at seven, eight, nine years of age. And some ended up watching seven or eight, six, seven, eight hours a day. I find that almost impossible to believe. Well, they're either um, studying or working from home and they just have it on constantly. So that raises itself a whole number of issues. Are there any particular, if you like, cohorts that are at risk? And any anyone any any person any boy with a an internet able device, regardless of family background, Correct. where they the live, stories are the culture, same. culture. The stories are the same everywhere I go. The stories are the same. Private schools, public schools, low socioeconomic, high socioeconomic. Um, regardless, the stories are the same. You'd like to think that they might be different, that there might be some more protective factors. But again, it's very hard even for, you know, good families, parents who are doing everything right to compete with this global industry, which is preying on our boys. We talk about accidental exposure. It's actually very deliberate exposure uh, to, build new, uh, to build new markets. In Cambodia, for example, the cost of the internet is a dollar a month. It's the cheapest form of entertainment for boys. So they're watching it all the time. They're just watching it all the time because it's the cheapest thing for them to do. That's just using Cambodia as an example. And this is gl gl global colonization of the world with the messages of the porn industry. So uh, every, everyone is at risk, really. So, I mean, particularly women and girls. There'll be many parents listening to this. Be thinking, who are harmed by the behaviors. So there'll be many parents, I would think, typically listening to a conversation like this or reading the statistics. Yes deeply troubled, yes. they'd be thinking, surely that's not happening under my roof. Mm. And they'll be asking themselves, how do we mm. guard against this? Mm. Well, it the may reality not be happening is it's under both their very roof. Difficult. It may not be happening under their roof. It may be, but it may not be. But that doesn't mean it's not happening on the school bus on the way home. It doesn't mean it's not happening in the schoolyard. That's where a lot of kids are being exposed, on the school camp where they're, they're showing each other porn and acting out what they're seeing. Uh, so families might have every um, internet filter known to, known to mankind on the home computer. They might have every rule, but even then the child isn't safe. I've had parents tell me my son was watching skateboarding videos at the kitchen table and porn came up. My child uh, wanted to look up a recipe and porn came up. Without them doing something to trigger that? Correct. The child wasn't looking for porn, but porn is looking for the child. Porn will find your child. And we have to wake up and smell the manure. That's the reality. And if we're not equipped to deal with it, uh, our kids are going to suffer even more than they already are. And they already are. Rising rates of depression, anxiety, low self-esteem. Girls are killing themselves now at, at rates uh, equal to boys for the first time uh, in history. 
you know, girls are exhausted curating this life on Instagram, which isn't a real life, uh, but they have to keep up uh, the sort of the myth of, of appearance and this happy life when really they're, they're struggling and they're suffering. Uh, it's, it's very hard to be a teenage girl in this culture. There's huge pressures to conform, to be thin, hot and sexy, to put yourself out there as sexually. You know, they're being sold a false, a false message about what empowerment and true freedom and liberation looks like. Uh, it's really a sex industry inspired uh, message that doesn't value their true um, dignity and value and worth. And that's, that's with the work we try to, we do in schools, we try to help our young people uh, see that they're, they're worth so much more than their limited stereotyped normative ideas in, um, proclaimed by the global sex industry. I don't even know what your original question was, but it was very good. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.